Yeah. Right, excellent. Thank you all very much for coming to this free meeting uh, about designing a truly digital government. Uh, my name is Mark Pack. I'm going to be chairing uh, this evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a member of the party's Federal Policy Committee uh, and also editor of Liberal Democrat Newswire, the uh, <laughs> monthly email newsletter that was described in the Daily Telegraph this week as an essential read. So any of you who are not signed up for this, I'm sure you will want to sign up to it soon. But rather than points from me, I'm sure you want to hear rather more from <coughs> our speakers. And I think that the subject of our digital government is quite an intriguing one uh, at the moment, because if you look at the general sort of mindset in the Liberal Democrats, uh, although we love people like Julian, who are ooze digital expertise, <laughs> uh, if you look at our 2010 manifesto, it somewhat embarrassingly talked as much about dealing with wheel clamping as it did about dealing with digital change. Now, I have nothing against the wheel clamping policy that was in the manifesto, especially as not only was it in our manifesto, Lynn Featherston, when she was at the Home Office, actually got it implemented, and it had an over 80% approval rating when you got tested the public's opinion on it. So as policies go, the wheel clamping policy is bloody good, but just maybe not quite as deserving of its billing relative to the whole digital world in the last manifesto as it's got. Um, I think the other thing that is notable is although, uh, you know, amongst Liberal Democrats we particularly like embracing the idea of digital and all the things that it can bring, we also love, particularly loved under the last government, attacking the Labour Party for huge NHS IT projects and failures. So there is a slightly schizophrenic approach we sometimes have as a party to these digital issues about both loving to knock failure of huge IT projects and also thinking that we should talk an awful lot about them, that we love them, but then they're not quite really making their way to the manifesto. So hopefully there will be lots of good ideas from the panel today that both will stimulate good questions from you and will also have to give the party some ideas about what to do in future. Um, obviously, as it is such a digital session, I hope you will be turning your phones on and tweeting, Facebooking, etc. Obviously, other social networks are available. Um, please do, please do uh, spend a large part of your time staring down at the screen, typing, typing away messages. The speakers won't be offended. Uh, we'll start with Julian, who, as I said, is a man who oozes digital goodness. Uh, he is also MP for Cambridge, and will give us his wonderful words of wisdom for six minutes. And after six minutes, I will throw some water at you, basically. Uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mark. Um, and didn't you write a book as well? I think yeah, indeed. It's called 101 Ways to Win an Election. Your comment for people should spend their time talking about it. I, I gave a speech at um, the Internet Service Providers Association annual conference. It was the weirdest conference I've ever spoken at, partly because it was in the uh, TUC building, which is a weird place anyway. But every single person was sat in circles typing. There was no feedback at all from the audience. I was told later it went down quite well. If you were <laughs> but I had no idea what was going on. So please do feel free to react as well. Um, and obviously, I mean, this, this is an absolutely critical area. Mark's absolutely right both to talk about some of the concerns and some of the benefits. But I thought it might be worth saying just a little bit about where digital government actually is now and how um, economically literate some of it is. Some of you may remember the Digital Economy Act, which was rammed through at the end of the last government. It's one of the things that I got very involved in. It was my first emergency motion at a conference ever, uh, which reversed our policy so that we were opposed it. Uh, we managed to stop it from actually happening. Had some awful bits in it, but what I vividly remember was the minister who was pushing it through, at one point talked about IP addresses as intellectual property addresses. <laughs> and there is a real problem of people not understanding what they are talking about at all. Um, and I, see this, I see this on a regular basis. There was a, a line in something that I managed to get taken out, I'm not going to say exactly what it was, um, which said, Google and other internet service providers should not be allowed to post child pornographic images. Okay, I mean, I agree, but Google are not an ISP, they don't, you know, and so on. And it's a real problem. Uh, when we have debates like this, we've had things which are <coughs> fantastic, driven by a fantastic misunderstanding of what the issues are, how you can solve them, and they're really dangerous. Um, so that's at the sort of policy level, the implementation level. Um, let me give you an idea of where Parliament is. I can table written questions, so I can ask a question of a minister to tell me some information. Um, it's actually quite exciting. I can now do that electronically. It's great. When the answer is produced, Guess what technology they use to get an answer from, let's say, the Treasury across the road to Westminster? Curves. So they print out 30 copies or so 
fold them up and put them into envelopes, which are then hand-delivered to various different locations, including Hansard. Hansard open the envelope, take the thing out, type it back up again, put it on something, they work for you, then scrape that, and I normally find out because either they work for the, you gets me an email, or one of the other alert services that scrapes they work for you sends me an email alert to say that it's come through. And then eventually I find a piece of paper. Um, there was a question about why this was, and apparently the reason is because different, um, different departments have slightly different IT systems, they're not quite compatible. If <laughs> you worked on IT, you know, it's a text stream. It's not hard to do. Um, so that's where we are for now, and that's hugely problematic. So one of the things would be really good would be to get government to understand what it's talking about. Uh, there is a long track record of um, schemes which are run by people who do not understand. That's one of the reasons why companies charge such vast amounts of money for things which don't really work. I was talking to one person who was told they were looking at the price they were quoted for uh, setting up a new domain name was about hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> That's a good deal. But think about it, from your business perspective, you know, if you can do that, given it costs you, what, £15? Yeah. You know, that's, a good, that's a good profit margin. <laughs> um, so it's nice that the government is keeping the digital industry going. Um, so there are issues there. There are also some real policy issues about what happens, because having a fully digital government, having it able to actually do, do things with the vast amounts of data that are available, is fantastic. It is also terrifying. And the real challenge is how we manage to pick up all the fantastic bits, or most of them, and avoiding all the terrifying bits. Now, we, we've traditionally talked in the party a lot about the terrifying bits. We've talked a lot about the communications data bill. Uh, and isn't it great that Nick Clegg killed it off? Uh, it does seem to be a bit undead. We, I think we've killed it several times now. But it will keep rising. And if anybody is better than I am on vampires, please let me know what you do after you've tried to see um, um, because we are concerned, as liberals, that the state should not just be able to have free access to all of our personal data. It's absolutely right. Um, we've been involved with uh, things like ACTA, I won't go through all, every single step that we've ever fought on. Um, we're very concerned about medical records. You know, should the state have access to our medical records and make them very, very widely available electronically? Well, you know, we're quite concerned about personalisation, but I really don't want some random NHS employee to be able to read my medical records. On the other hand, if I'm knocked unconscious in a car crash, I'd really quite like them to be able to get access to my medical records. And there is a huge tension there. If you go all the way out on the privacy line, you are missing massive benefits. If you go all the way out on the other line, you are causing massive harm, privacy violations, all sorts of nasty consequences which follow. How do we get this right? How do we deal with that personal benefit and extract that? What about Slightly more controversial issue in some ways, collecting all of this health data and using it for medical research. Fantastically helpful if we can all be healthier. On the other hand, do you want GSK to have access to all of your medical records? How do we get this to work and not, uh, not cause problems? How do we get the Borders Agency, for example, now brought back into the Home Office, to actually be competent uh, with its data, so complete and utter mess? Um, so those are some of the problems that we have to face, and there are huge decisions to be thought about. How do we value the benefits versus the privacy? We've said a lot about what our party policy would be on this in a fantastic paper, and I say that partly because these two people have to write it. Um, preparing the ground, stimulating growth in the digital economy, policy paper 101, passed by this conference. Um, and that sets out a huge lot of things that I haven't had time to go through. It talks about actually the economic benefits. My constituency in Cambridge has now 56,000 high tech jobs, uh, bringing 12.5 billion pounds in revenue. Not all related to the digital economy. Very few of them will be anything like that scale if we don't get it right. There's a huge amount to do. I could talk about net neutrality. I could talk about how government policy fosters that innovation. But I'd like to hear from what you have to say. I'd like to hear from the rest of the panel, particularly because I just got some money from the Joseph Roundtree Reform Trust to hire somebody for the next two years to work on privacy in a digital age. So I want to hear the ideas now, and we'll have answers in hopefully just under two years in time for the election. Fantastic. That like Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll forgive you a few seconds. <laughs> you really. Julian's point about our different attitudes towards privacy versus convenience is very well made. It reminded me of uh, the fact that a few weeks ago I went to see a uh, physiotherapist and was really struck by how the records that she had in front of her were completely unconnected 
to the records that my GP had. So having gone to see my GP and gone through various stuff in May, diligent, diligently making notes, I then go to see the specialist and have to go through everything all again. So I went away from that thinking, oh, this is really daft. Why on earth can they not share information? Because the physiotherapist can then know what I've said to the GP and that can save a bit of time. And actually it turned out the GP had maybe, you know, their initial thought had been slightly wrong. So they'll, if they were to get the information back from this physiotherapist, that would help them being a better GP. Surely that's brilliant. And then I sat down in my computer uh, a bit later in that day to sort of write a blog post and wanted to look up something that I had written previously and stumbled on a blog that I'd written uh, a couple of months previously saying how dreadful all of this insecure <laughs> data is you know, using the personal demographic service was. So I have no idea in the end what my view should be. Hopefully, however, someone who has a slightly clearer idea of what their views are is David Frank, our next speaker from uh, everything everywhere. Um, and I think if I'm right, EE, sorry indeed, rebranded, apologies, EE. <laughs> Lovely TV ads though, by the way, if I can make up for my blemish on your branding there. And I think if I'm right, you also went to the civil servant on the Digital Economy Act. I did. Right. <laughs> so it would be interesting to see whether you have any slight differences in opinion from Julian then. Over to you. Well, thank you, Chairman, for that introduction. So it's my uh, sort of pleasure to be here uh, this evening. So, uh, I'm from the EU, as already been announced, and we're the UK's largest mobile communication company and we're the first to bring 4G or high-speed mobile broadband to the UK uh, just uh, over a year ago. And this has also been referenced, we brought Kevin Bacon to the UK TV screen here. <laughs> <laughs> we think there's some rather good and amusing commercials. Uh, picking up your point briefly before I sort of make a few remarks, yes, I was before joining the union three years ago, the UK civil servant, and I did indeed work on the Digital Britain program and helping to take uh, support the then minister take the Digital Economy Act through Parliament. Um, I probably now is the time to put my hand up. I think I was the one who wrote the letter that had to be uh, incorrect, sort of spelling out what my IP address is. And it was probably because I did it at two in the morning after Parliament had finished. So he took a lot of flack for that, but I probably should have put my hand up a long time ago. <laughs> so um, I think obviously we are a network company, and the network is absolutely core to the services we offer, and that's sort of quite germane, obviously to what we're talking about this evening uh, and what Policy Exchange has very thoroughly sort of looked at in, in their report around how government gets better, as it says in the sort of title, gets better, faster and stronger, as well as potentially using the savings from being more digitally connected to have a sort of intelligent debate around how the state then looks. Um, I think at EE we're certainly interested in sort of wider policy debates, um, but I think what I wanted to touch on in my sort of few minutes of remarks this evening was around both how government considers using digital technology to communicate with us as citizens or consumers, as individuals or as sort of businesses, but also how it uses it internally. Because obviously talking about digital by default policy making with all the sort of legitimate privacy concerns and where does that tension play out, right? If we think that EE, and I, I think this view is shared in other companies, whether they're in the sort of mobile communication sector and the wider technology space, how government procures digital technology is absolutely key to how successful it will then be in delivering on some of those objectives. So having a small number of very large providers, which then freezes out smaller, innovative, more nimble organisations, some of them obviously do you know from sitting in your constituency, but also across the UK. There are great examples of small companies doing innovative uh, and, and new things. And as individuals, we all take the benefits and mobility for granted. Um, it doesn't matter what handset you use or even what network you're on, we are all familiar with the ability to access information, access our emails, or look up train times if we're wondering when the next train service is, or, or, or email the doctor if we want to make an appointment, even if we're wondering if you read, why they're not joining up their records. But the UK Civil Service, and there's a form one I'm sort of very conscious of this, don't have that luxury with the equipment that they are given. And it therefore is a bit of a challenge for them, as the Policy Exchange and others have pointed out, how do you understand that sort of digital space and how do you successfully deliver that if civil servants themselves struggle to have access to the same technology? And you then potentially end up uh, with a security classification system where civil servants classify the sort of toughest end of the range out of fear of 
um, being criticised in the media or by the National Audit Office, but it then harms their ability to do their job, something that I think we would all look at and sort of wonder critically, is that really what it uh, should be about? And obviously as the internet has moved into the mobile space and Microsoft, Samsung, and on ourselves are all seeing huge growth in mobile data and how people access the internet and how, and how they like to do that. The fact that civil servants don't also have that capability might undermine some of their drive around improving digital skills, something that we care passionately about and involved with through our partnership with Go On. So, I'm not sure they're easy answers, but some of the possible answers would be to open up how government procures the actual devices, the technology, the applications, with how it sort of looks at how civil servants use that technology. Does it encourage a bring your own culture in certain environments? And then if it does that, how you're looking again at how government can use its sort of own actions to encourage people about the safety of using uh, this technology, you know, the health and safety inspectorate visiting restaurants, giving confidence to small business that being online, using cloud computing to share documents and collaborate is something that's of value for them. So I think I've been told I have about a minute. So I think to summarise, I think you know, digital technology is huge, huge benefits and we all benefit from that. I'm sure most of us use an internet uh, sort of service to book our train ticket or airline travel to get here. And how do we use that kind of open, easy ability to share and access information? How do we take that into government and ensure that they also have a sort of open procurement tool <coughs> so that they can really deliver the benefits in a more open world that the technology offers? Fantastic. Thank you very much, David. I, I guess in, in fairness to the civil service, it's worth mentioning that there is a fantastically successful part of the civil service at the moment when it comes to digital in terms of the government digital service GDS and the work they've been doing, particularly on redoing the gov.uk sort of central website, in terms of making something better and faster and easier to use and saving money. It's a quite, you know, they have been a quite remarkably successful team, particularly when you then add into the fact that they're working in the civil service and they're doing stuff with IT. I think either way, it's a bit slightly unsung heroes in the, amongst the wider public. But what they're, the work they're doing is remarkably impressive. I think also the work they're doing is quite tricky for the Liberal Democrats in terms of what lesson do we learn from it, because it doesn't neatly fit anywhere on the political spectrum. It is, you know, central government civil servants doing things, but in ways that show uh, not huge amounts of respect for traditional civil service ways of doing things, and for example, at levels of pay which if people were being appointed in a local council at that levels of pay, we would all be out campaigning with our petitions about how atrocious the levels of pay are and how outrageous they are. So there's a real mix of, I think, different lessons there that don't fit neatly into the sort of political cliches. Uh, but on to our next speaker, uh, Mary Reid, who is uh, a very long-standing, very successful Liberal Democrat activist and politician, but also a very impressive career uh, in the digital arena, including being the current chair of eDemocracy.org. And also, I'm not sure if you'll thank me for saying this, in many ways, Mary is the patron saint of Liberal Democrat MP websites, having been so closely involved, directly or indirectly, in the creation of the first few. So over to our patron saint, Mary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I want to focus on two things that haven't been mentioned so far. One of them is local government, and the other is um, e-democracy, participatory democracy rather than just the provision of services. Now, 10 years ago, uh, the, what was then the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister is now Communities and Local Government, set up a series of, a whole programme okay. that they called the National Project Programme. Those of you involved in local government at the time may have heard of that. And the idea of these projects, and about 20 of them, was to uh, get local government going on uh, using online technologies for communicating with residents. I think the feeling was that it could be, it, because of the smaller scale, um, it would be easier to kick things off there than actually in central government. And I think that's probably the truth. 
Um, each of these projects explored a specific aspect. There was one about dealing with online planning, um, dealing with payments, dealing with um, workflow around um, things like uh, committees, committee management and so on. Um, at that point, there were still some councils that did not have websites. And practically none of them had any online transactions. Uh, there was no chance to report problems, there was no consultations, no petitions, and there was a serious issue about consistency and standards, which uh, made it difficult to actually um, pro provide systems which uh, were transferable from one system to another. But at the end of that programme, which lasts about three years, local government was in a much stronger position than central government and was doing stuff that was beginning to look quite interesting. Now, I was asked to chair one of these projects. It was the National Project for Local E-Democracy. It was the last one they kicked off because nobody knew what to do with it. And they thought that maybe they ought to have councillors involved in something to do with democracy. So it was the only national project which had councillors on the board. And indeed, I chaired and I had a Labour and a Tory uh, colleague as, as vice chairs, and we work very well together as a team. Now, e-democracy here means citizens being involved in decision-making processes and in identifying issues uh, in relation to a council. Forget about e-voting. I didn't touch it. That would be the wrong problem. It recognised that um, local government is not just about provision of services. It is about government. And so there needed to be um, uh, systems in place that would enhance that. <laughs> and because it was local, it was much better place to develop democratic processes than unwieldy national government. Now, I was a councillor in Kingston, where we'd already practiced and pioneered a lot of ways of openness and transparency in our dealings with residents, getting them involved in decision making, all through offline um, mechanisms of course. We had open meetings, anyone could speak at any council meeting, the heavily used consultation and so on. And I, nice to say that since then Kingston has remained in Liberal Democrat hands and uh, we've continued to do, um, to carry on those processes and I'm very happy to share with you some of the techniques that we use for involving people. In, um, in, in making decisions and dealing with local issues. None of this was to undermine representative democracy. Absolutely clear about that. Um, but the better informed the councillors are, the more they interacted with the people who were directly affected by any decisions that were being made, we believed the better the decisions would be. Um, I dislike the term engagement which was used quite a lot, it's a very top-down term. I'm much more interested in council officers and councillors listening, responding, being aware of issues, being where the residents are doing their talk. And of course, <coughs> increasingly in an online world, of course, and nowadays, obviously in the world of social media. I've also been involved for many years in an organisation called eDemocracy.org, which Mark referred to. Now, this is an international social enterprise based in Minnesota. Um, and they claim to have invented the term eDemocracy in 1994. Now, just think about that date. Nearly 20 years ago, the web was in its very early days. There was practically no interactivity when you went to a website, it provided just a bit of information for you. Hardly anybody was exploring the idea that people could, that we could use the web to give people a voice. And what they do, what eDemocracy does, is very simple, but it does it really, really well. It runs local issues forums based on quite small geographical areas, and has built up a huge amount of expertise in how to make them work. I invited eDemocracy.org for the national project to come over the UK, and um, uh, they set up a number of these systems here. Today, their emphasis is very much with working with disadvantaged communities. 
Now today, the technology to run a, a, a forum, an online forum, is ubiquitous. So the secret lies not in the technology, but knowing how to manage them so that they are not dominated by a few, so that they reach excluded groups. Some of the issues that actually I had to tackle in another one of my hats on, which is a, one of the editors of Lib Dem Boys. And but most importantly, from our perspective this evening, uh, they understand how and when to bring in the elected representatives so they can capture the issues and respond to them. The best forums are those in which councillors are active participants, providing background information when needed, picking up issues, <coughs> discussing how they can best be dealt with. Such forums flow in and out of, seamlessly, between online and offline activity because they are geographically based. Neighbours meet each other on the street, in the meetings, they share their observations with a wider group of neighbours online. Now, as a Liberal Democrat, and one who is fundamentally committed to community politics, that's why I'm a Liberal Democrat, I feel very strongly that interactivity between citizens and their elected representatives lies at the heart of good government. And digital technologies have given us one of the means to achieve this. Thank you very much. Okay. I have to say, all the speakers have kept admirably to time so far, so no pressure on our last one. Uh, obviously, I'm trying to run this not quite like the trains operate. Um, and next, actually, I should just say one other, just to illustrate one of Mary's points is your reference to, to how old the democracy is reminded me that there was a wonderful bit of advice they came up with for running email discussion lists uh, in the sort of mid to late 90s, which I, I, I think would be just brilliant if we could find a way to easily translate this to other sort of online discussion forums now, where often the online discussion about politics is not in an email discussion list. And, and they found that what worked really well was restricting people on an email discussion list to sending two messages to that list a day. It's a brilliant way of stopping a small number of loud mouthed, often angry people drowning out the rest of the conversation. I was going to tell you, Mark, that was edemocracy.org. It was indeed, it excellent, was yeah. Came up with that. Uh, so, obviously, I'm in no way common, uh, make, make passing judgment on any of the excellent comments that's on the dead voice when I uh, when I think about <laughs> But um, on to our final speaker, Chris Yu, who is head of digital uh, government at the Policy Exchange, who are also the organiser of the meeting and kind providers of the, the both alcohol and coffee, which I think is, is, is a nice combination, an excellent combination. <laughs> so we should be particularly grateful, but I'm sure you also have many interesting things to say, Chris. Super, thank you. Okay, and um, well, great to see you all. Um, and I should say, we've also got a book out. It looks like this. Um, <laughs> many of you have probably picked it up. Um, you can get a copy on the web. Um, Find it in your favourite uh, tablet bookstore, and um, there's even a plain HTML version if you like that sort of thing too. Um, so do please pick a copy of that up and, uh, and take it away with you. Um, look, I'm going to give you a quick tour through the findings of that piece of work and give you some suggestions um, for how um, we can change the way government does technology and digital. Um, but first, a bit of background. So um, when we did the work, the thing that struck us was um, if you think about the way the world has changed over the last decade, 50 years, 20 years, um, what is apparent is that the internet has turned pretty much every industry on its head. Um, and I won't give you a long list of the ways that's happened, you don't know as well as I do. Um, the place where that hasn't really happened is government. Um, we heard a bit about um, the mountain of paper earlier on. I'll give you a few more examples from the report just to do just to horrify you. Uh, the Crown Prosecution Service prints one million sheets of paper a day. Um, the DOA headquarters in Swansea, uh, where they process your drug license applications, receives two articulated lorries full of paper every single day. Um, the passport office, when you go to renew your passport, and I went through this recently, um, you get the website, you fill in everything online, you think it's going swimmingly, you push submit, and in an office somewhere, it's printed and posted to you to check and post back. Um, it's terrifying. Um, now, if you hold that thought and think about the way the world is changing, it's clear that there's two really important things that are going to happen over the next decade. One is that um, digital and internet will be absolutely everywhere. Um, 
We already have most of the population online in the UK. Um, what we will find is that, frankly, because of these, not necessarily an Apple phone, right, but a smartphone, um, before we know it, everyone will be on the internet, um, possibly without even realizing it. Um, and if you've read the um, Eric Schmidt, Derek Cohen book about the new digital age, one of the things that will have struck you is that when they talk about the future of digital and the internet, none of this is a story about people sitting in front of computers with mice. Right? It's about the handsets and the tablets. So that's happening. The other thing that's happening is around openness. So we traditionally thought about openness in technology, and people talk about and Wikipedia is this amazing example of collaboration and openness online. Um, what we're finding when we think about government is actually um, that is starting to percolate into questions about policy and transparency. So you've opened this not just in the technology stack, but in the way that government starts to make decisions and our ability to get insight into that. So put all of that together. Um, what might you do if you are rebuilding government over the next five to ten years? Um, in the report, we set down um, three areas to think about. The first is um, to take a really deep breath and then digitize everything that you can. Now, it doesn't mean digitize everything. There are plenty of areas where face-to-face -face contact with human beings is really, really important, and you shouldn't sacrifice that. There are plenty of areas, some of which I did earlier, where actually we do not need to be moving in all the of paper around the country. Um, and if you take that a step further, you might also move into digital proofs. So, for example, um, at the moment, lots of parts of my private life run terribly smoothly and digitally, so at the moment I'm thinking about moving home, I'll have to engage a solicitor and so on. At some point I'll probably have to photocopy my driving license, get an upstanding member of the community to certify that it's a true likeness, post it somewhere. Um, and the technology exists to do this in a much more speedy way. So that's step one. Um, step two is about getting a grip on data in government and making much smarter use of it. And Julie, you alluded to some of the tensions here around um, the benefits versus the privacy side. Um, and you're right, it's something that we've got to be so, so mindful of. Um, one thought for your privacy review is um, this idea about personal data stores. Right? Can you put um, control of personal data back in the hands of a citizen? Can I hold my medical records <coughs> encrypted and grant and revoke access to them um, as I see fit? And there are lots of technical issues around that, but I think it's something that's worth, worth considering. Um, and the third and most important thing is around leadership in the public sector. So the thing that will make or break this agenda is not the technology or the devices. It's whether the people leading change in the public sector have the skills and the attitude to do this and do it well. Um, some of the recommendations we put down in the report around more interchange between um, the private sector and past the civil service so that more people, the senior levels of government, have seen digital innovation firsthand we think are very important. Um, and we'd like to also see more openness around um, uh, not just the policy making process, but actually, frankly, who is doing government and what are they doing. So at the moment, we can get just about the senior civil servants. Um, <coughs> why don't we have something which um, actually lists every single civil servant and what they're doing and what they did before? Um, you might build it yourself. You might think it's called LinkedIn. I don't know. But, there should be a way to find out what's going on because actually that would help more connections be made and possibly be sponsor. Um, and the prize out of all of this is huge. So if you go to the data and look at the way productivity has changed in the economy, um, if you pull the stats from the ONS from 97 to 2012, what you find is that um, productivity in the services sector as a whole went up about 24%. Um, in government services it went up over 9%. Um, if you look at the ICT sector, it went up 100%. So something is going on. We think a lot of that has to do with digital and data and the internet. Um, and if you can drag the public sector up to what's happened in the private sector, there are many tens of billions of pounds to be saved. Here we go. Fantastic. For most of you in the hall, in, in the room, that's a first for something you've heard from a speaker, uh, from a sort of outside organisation at a fringe meeting, actually coming along and saying, I want to spend less money. It's <laughs> normally all fringe meetings, you know, any, particularly if they've got a Lib Dem minister you know, in the room, they go along with a long, go away with a long wish list of items to spend more money on. So I think, uh, I think the idea of spending less should be particularly appealing to Julian and colleagues when it comes to drawing up policies for the party in future. 
Right, let's see what we've got in the way of questions. Uh, let's maybe take an initial three and then see how far we get. So let's start with the lady there. Thank you. My name is former Forest Commandura and I'm a librarian and book indexer, one time counsellor, um, sat in an IT and public admin working group about 25 years ago, I think. What concerns me here is that we are looking too often at digitising existing practices rather than looking at the, the method of government. How do we best govern people? What are the services they want? Mm -hmm. um, let's not digitise what we do, but think about how technology can help us do them better. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. I think we had a gentleman right at the back there, yeah. Okay, uh, Ian I up from Lewis, where one of the early Kevin Bacon ED adverts was shot. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you got his autograph. Um, uh, I wasn't there. Um, but I, two quick points. One uh, about mental records. I used to be on our district council of Traveller and Gypsy Working Group until the Tories scrapped it. Um, but one of the things that, uh, I mean, one of the big problem with travellers is they might never see the same medical professional twice. Um, and the solution for them is handheld paper records. Um, and I was very tempted to try and get hold of uh, that myself because I, my wife works in the NHS and knows how easy it is for anybody in the NHS to access a medical records. Um, but uh, maybe some digital equivalent of that would be uh, useful, perhaps, as well. Um, the other thing is local government websites um, are either really crap or really expensive, uh, and still crap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'd like to see local government, local authorities, uh, consortium with local authorities, funding uh, open source development of things like planning application databases and Excellent. And then we have a gentleman at the front over here. Uh, my name is Bob Barr. I'm, I'm a geographer, a Warrington Borough Councillor, and an open data campaigner. Uh, when I took over the property and planning portfolio in Warrington, the first question I asked was, who owns the land in Warrington? And I was staggered my property people and my planning people said, oh, we don't know. Well, we need to find out. We go onto the land registry website and we pay three pounds a pop to look at individual parcels. And I said, it's 100,000 parcels in Warrington. Why haven't you got the data for all of them? because it's not open, it's not available. Land Registry released the land parcels on Monday, hobbled completely by all the survey, so they are utterly useless. Worse than that, addresses are central to an awful lot of this work. I'm desperately disappointed that uh, Vince Cable has allowed Michael Fallon to sell the postcode address file together with Royal Mail. So every time we pre-populate any address field, there's going to be a ka going to a privatised wrong mail. I think that's outrageous. If we're serious about open data and opening up these sorts of processes, that sort of national infrastructure data must be open, must be owned by uh, the country. And our government's not doing that. Okay. Uh, while the panel's all sort of thinking about its answers to those, I should just, I guess, throw in uh, a, a good example of the problem of if you simply digitise existing paperwork is actually think about conference paperwork. What we, what we have is we have a printed uh, agenda and then a printed directory which also tells you what's happening on what days and then a separate printed conference extra and then a separate printed conference daily. And although that process has been digitised, it's been digitised in a way that you now get four separate <laughs> electronic documents rather than one automatically updated. Uh, and I'm sure the public sector makes many, many far worse mistakes, but it's quite a good example. Should we, um, should we start in the order, order in which you all spoke? So, Julian, do you want to go first? Uh, thank you. I mean, I think you know, they're all really interesting points. So, you know, Maury, you're absolutely right. We can look at much better practices that aren't constrained by what we're trying to do. And you know, this is true in so many places. There's, you know, just give one example. There's, net, there's a project that I think has been finished to collect all of UK legislation together because it is very, very hard to work out what the law is currently, because it's sort of a whole series of diffs, effectively, in you know, no particularly good way. And there was a case, and somebody will probably remember the details of it, where somebody was prosecuted for something, they appealed, there was a second appeal, it was all hung on the details of the case. It was only right at the very end that somebody spotted that the thing in question had actually been repealed just before they committed it. <laughs> um, and throughout this whole thing, and somebody, you know, people are nodding, so I think they do remember this, no, there wasn't a way of finding out what the law was right now. Um, so yes, having have, having things that aren't stick, you know, that aren't sticks that tell you what the current position is, will be quite useful. Um, 
Uh, Ian, you're absolutely right. There, there, there are more interesting ways of doing things than bits of paper records, but you have to think about how you do it. Do you have a fob that just carries your data with you? Do you have it stored somewhere else? What happens is there's more and more data available for these things. Um, we're not too far away from uh, gene sequence, full genome sequencing being a sensible thing to do at birth. Now, whether it will actually happen or not is another question. But that's quite a lot of data to print out. No, it's, 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 it's the least plausible bit of Gattaca when, when, when the, the woman is handed a printout of the entire genome. <laughs> uh, Three billion characters of it. It's not a very interesting read. Um, so, I mean, that's key. And I think your comment about open source is quite key. Uh, and the paper which we, we published does talk a lot about open source. Government is still very skeptical of open source. Um, I've got a written question which was a bit more positive recently, but they are, uh, people are a bit unsure about what open source really means, how to engage with it. That's true at local government levels, but vast amounts are handed over to Microsoft all the time. There is so much more that could be done uh, with open source. Um, or just much more agile methods of development. There's a, a tool that the Department of Transport builds to help you find a cycle route from somewhere to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And it costs 1.4 million, I think. And there's another one written by a couple of guys in Cambridge in the cycling campaign, which costs 30,000 and is better by a long shot. I recommend Cycle Streets um, if you haven't used it. In terms of open data, um, you know, absolutely. I, I've had various meetings with various ministers. Ed Davey, which is his job, Joe now, not just about postcode data, but also about the OS data, about the Met Office data. You know, and, and the problem is trying to persuade the economists in the civil service. Of, uh, that you will make money by making this free. There is money that comes in from selling Met Office data, for example. Actually, most of the money that comes in comes from other bits of government, but some of it comes from elsewhere. If you say, look, this is just free, stuff will happen in the economy. Quite hard to prove. Denmark's done some quite interesting work on it. I think we should be doing it. In fact, the paper that we passed a few years ago now does say very specifically, uh, if I can find the right point, uh, there should be an assumption that public, non-personal data belongs to the nation, so it should be freely available. That was the principle we tried to get to. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And in fact, the legislation position is even worse uh, than you pictured it, because I put in an FOI request to my local council to ask for the list of low, currently enforced council bylaws. Um, and I got this very nice letter back saying, look, we, we'd quite like to you know, meet your request, but unfortunately, quite a lot of them are written on these really fragile old pieces of paper. <laughs> <laughs> it would take us so long to photocopy them safely. Could you just let us know, what, is there a particular bit of information you really are? And so they kindly sent me a list of the, sort of the headings of all of them, saying, could you just you know, maybe pick a few from the list so it doesn't make life too hard? And it, it's both laughable, but also those are laws that, theoretically at least, I could be punished for breaking. Um, hopefully I won't, obviously just in case anyone is tweeting that, I'm not intending to spit on the ceiling in Islington, which is still illegal. <laughs> but, uh, over to you, Dave. Um, so, um, one thought about sort of what laws are in force. I attended earlier in the year an interesting sort of conference, set of talks in London, um, which highlighted the issue about naming what's the law of the land. Um, and that in some countries that's much more pressing than in the UK. So they gave the example of Nigeria, where um, the, the most widely downloaded app to sort of all smartphones was a copy of the Nigerian constitution, because that's actually quite hard to get hold of. But for the legal profession there is actually rather important that <coughs> they can defend their uh, sort of clients. Um, coming to or your point about using the sort of, uh, the sort of technology to step back and think again about how one does things. I think uh, we, we'd agree, I mean, uh, EE is part of a wider technology this sort of space environment which is all about disruption and asking why not and how, how can we do things differently. So I think you know, that's something we're facing as a company and it's also how we look at doing things internally. So I, I think you're right there. And then on the issue of so whether it, uh, open data or medical records, um, and sort of how you give the individual ownership uh, of um, their data. Um, obviously the government is looking at this. There's the My Data Initiative, which we're sort of taking part, and then there's this sort of ID assurance work that the Cabinet Office are sort of looking at about how you use uh, mobile phones, which are very personal to each of us because we hold this sort of contractual relationship on them, and how you use that to identify yourself 
to the state. So speaking to Chris's point about authenticating your passport renewal application, or you've moved house and you want to set up your new council tax mm -hmm. uh, payment service, that you could do it in a secure way from your phone so that the government body knows it's you. And I think that's something we, as a network provider and the company relationships with app developers and others in that space, find sort of quite interesting uh, sort of space that, that will only grow. Fantastic. Mary, in fact. Yeah, well, I've been um, repeating what has been said already about open source, which I've done on entirely. Um, just a challenge, I think, to those of you who are councillors. Um, in your local council, how is I, things like the website and IT in general, how are they perceived? Are they perceived as um, technical issues? Or are they perceived as strategic issues? Who is responsible for them? The person, the council officer, who is responsible for, for that area of work, what status is that person on? What level are they at? How close are they to the most senior, the senior directors across your, your council? And your councillors, which councillor has those issues in their portfolio? And how influential are they? Now, I've grappled with that myself. I had e-government in my <coughs> portfolio and um, really did a lot of work about raising the status and the understanding that these issues are not just technical issues. They're vitally important to um, the reputation and the operation of all aspects of council work and particularly its communication with residents. Chris. Okay, and I'll keep this really brief because I want to hear more questions. But um, so on digitising um, practices and um, being aware of that, I guess um, the point is that one of the things technology lets you do is understand um, much better how your actions affect outcomes. Um, and the thing that government's got to get better at is tracking the data and the insights that will be helpful in delivering the outcomes that we want to see. And this is one of the areas where actually technology businesses are really, really good but actual insights, um, the government has a lot to learn. Um, on the um, medical records and people should be in charge of those, I'm broadly, broadly with you. Um, on the point about local government websites, one thing that's really interesting, and Mark, you mentioned um, gov.uk, and one of the great things they've done is um, put all of their development material on GitHub. So you can actually, if you're building a website, um, and we did this when we were building the digital version of our report, you can pull down the assets from um, GitHub, and you can repurpose them for your own projects. It's amazing. It's free. Um, and astonishingly, you still pay people to re redo that work. It's, um, it's kind of mad. And even more yeah. astonishing in local governments, obviously, lots of councils pay different firms money to do exactly yeah. the same work. Indeed. Um, and on open data, yes, so um, I think the bottom line is um, data generated by the public sector as a byproduct of serving the public, you know what, belongs to the public. Basically, a good slogan. Right? Oh, crikey, we've had lots of questions. Well, what we might try and do uh, is maybe not have all of you answer all of them, as it were, to try and get through a few more quickly. Right, let's start with gentlemen in front. Okay, uh, first apologies for sitting here with a pen and a piece of paper. <laughs> 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 um, I, I, I work Sorry, for, your name is so Paul Griffiths from Worcester. Yeah. Uh, I also work for an IT company that sells services to the public sector. Um, and there are loads of things I could talk around, but the one thing I want to highlight is one of the problems we have is that different parts of the public services renew their computer systems at different times, and they're not always in sync. And one of the major difficulties we have is that even if we're trying to bring System A up to date, we've got to interface with System B, C, and D, who are out of sync. And is there any way there could be some coordination where we all have a, a destination endpoint where we're, where we're trying to end up? Yeah. Okay, we'll have a couple of questions. Uh, a lady at the back on the aisle. Is that That's you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, thanks very much for giving some comments. I just wanted initially just to echo. Sorry, your name as well is. Oh, sorry. I'm Jessica Watson yeah. from uh, the Think Tank, the International Agenda Centre. We do work on population aging. Um, so, in this kind of digital access way, but also um, I just done a piece of research actually which involved reviewing policies of local authorities and bloody hell there's a long way to go on the website. <laughs> 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 um, my question is actually around um, 
So our website's hosting quite interesting stuff like Fix My Street. And I wonder if there's a role for sort of like a, a third or private sector helping force, um, perhaps um, as we transition towards hopefully better authority websites. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, a excellent idea there. Yeah. Hi, um, Anna Clark, City of Chester. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, an area of this debate which is often neglected, which is archives and records management. I am an archivist, and dealing with digital records is really difficult when it comes to long term preservation. And I was hoping that people had considered or thought about um, the obligation of government to preserve records not just now, not just for communication, not just now, but permanently to record the functions of government long term. And this becomes very problematic when you talk about all kinds of website systems, different functions of government which are involved here. And I think it's a really important issue to point out. Yeah, actually, so we've got four panellists. Let's take a fourth question as well, just the gentleman there. Yeah. You start, yeah. Um, Ed Kearns, uh, uh, County Councillor in Kingshire. I'm not following Julian, but seeing as he's almost every fringe of Ed, I'd be willing to keep hopping into him. I think one of the biggest challenges, and there are many in local government at the moment, not least the, the budget, but it is, is e-government. And actually, I don't think a lot of my colleagues have realised that it's changing the role of the councillor forever. And I've joined a sort of pilot project, I think it's with uh, e-public, I think, and ILGA, East England Local Government Association, the network councillor. I would recommend people to look at that research as well. Um, but it's changing because, as, as I think Julian said, you know, he was in a meeting, he didn't know what was actually being said. And I've actually tweeted in one of my first public meetings, I won't be tweeting in this meeting because I'll have to be um, concentrating in this public meeting, what's going on in the moment. But it's a challenge. I don't think my answer, whilst it covered me, is sufficient, really. And also, at the same time, you've got councils who just don't have the technology. So finally, we've got to be like bring your own device thing because all of our technology is so much better than the council. But how can a council start spending lots of money when there's no money in the budget at all? So no, should, we, should we start with you? As yeah. Other days very much seem to be in your area. Yeah, yeah. And well, can I just pick up on the archives? That was something I really got involved with actually when it came out of my concern because uh, nobody else apart from the archivist understood the significance and uh, but she convinced me <laughs> and so I, uh, I, I championed that um, but yes and the changing role of the councillor do you see that as a change for the better or for the worse? Uh, mostly better but massively complex. Yes it, it, it's just that for me as a Liberal Democrat um, empowering citizens to be involved in shaping um, you know, the decisions that are made about their area is uh, crucial to what I do. It's, it's, all, it's about, well, I, actually I'm no longer a councillor, but that, that, that I did. It's about giving away power, but helping, making sure that the channels of communication are there and the um, systems are there. So, so, you know, there's a proper and real communication. So um, I think it's something we as Liberal Democrats should really, really welcome. Thank you, Mary. Chris, do you want to pick up on some of the other points? Yes, so, um, so the point about um, third parties and um, local and um, civil society and so on, I think is, is absolutely right. And um, again, it's one of these things which um, maybe wasn't possible at scale before the internet. Um, and if you think about um, the reasons why um, services like Facebook or Twitter or any of them have become so successful, one of them is actually that they have APIs to access the service, so they can be baked into other products and can all the case. Um, and there's no reason why that shouldn't start happening for government services. One of the things that we think ought to happen over a longer horizon is um, actually government should publish read and write APIs for all of its services. And you know what, if I can build um, an app which I don't know, securely integrates my tax return and my online banking, um, and HRT is probably never going to do that for me. My bank's probably never going to do that for me. But if I can, then, then why not? Um, I think one of the little roadblocks around here is um, still ministers and departments love to announce stuff, right? So um, ministers still love to announce an app for something or we build a micro site. Um, and actually just letting go and trusting that the community will do it 
or maybe you build it first but you open source it. Um, will be an interesting journey to watch. Fantastic. Um, David, do you have to on some of those? Um, I think the point I'd like to pick up is the point Paul you raised about sort of different contracts at different stages, and I think that's frustration that anybody who or small who tries to be a supply to government uh, would share. Um, having been sounded a bit critical, I think that the government procurement service is trying to look at that in some areas, not, not all clearly, but I think that's an area where sort of individual organisations, companies, trade groups who wish to sort of be considered by government need to keep reminding that there are big complexities here and having sort of contracts with different endpoints when you're trying to deliver the same service across different bits of government can complicate matters. Um, at the same time, there could be good reasons why there are different contract endpoints. So I think there isn't an, an, an easy answer to, to that. Julian, I, I guess the archives question has probably had the least sort of answering, so if you want to maybe um, you concentrate on that one. Uh, fine. Uh, I, mean, I think you know, you're actually right, we do need to have those archives. And there, is, I mean, there are two issues. One is trying to keep uh, archives digitally of analog stuff, which there is, mm -hmm. to make sure it doesn't decay further. Mm -hmm. But then also to make sure the digital archives that we have are in formats which we'll be able to look at again in exactly. a few years' time. Um, and both of those are really, really important. We're already losing early digital stuff and, and a lot of analog stuff. Um, uh, I'm not an expert in actually how to do it, but yes, one should. Um, uh, and our, our paper talked a bit about this. I just want, I want to pick up this the question from Ed about the change of role, because as an MP, it's also very different. Mm -hmm. And the level of direct democracy is now really quite astonishing. When I have uh, however many people who follow me, 12,000 or something, including a large number of my constituents, who do tell me how they want me to vote on various things. Um, not necessarily always on the days of their votes. Or, or, <laughs> I, I have had people say, why didn't you vote for this? And, well, because it's in the House of Lords. It's, <laughs> um, but, it, but it's a really interesting issue. And I use that a lot to communicate with things, to consult with people, and it's fantastic, and a pain, and wonderful. Um, but there's also a huge number of my constituents who are not on Twitter, astonishingly. Even in Cambridge, there are, you know, um, and that is a huge problem. It's very, very easy to fall into that the wrong side of that digital divide, mm -hmm. you know. And everybody who I communicate has a, communicate with has a computer of some kind. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be very, very careful to avoid tripping into that sort of group thing, which we saw so awfully with the AV campaign. Mm -hmm. Everybody was campaigning for AV. Only knew people online who also agreed, mm -hmm. and that's why we lost. Um, I think the other thing about the systems, and you know, it's, it's a lot about the need for sort of fairly open APIs. There's a particular issue with a lot of uh, government data and also big company data, that getting the data out is quite hard. They're often written, <coughs> I don't know if your stuff would be, with a way that didn't allow you to just dump all the data out afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and so extracting data from a large system can be incredibly complicated. Um, and the, the third part is fixed by street and so forth. Well, you know, it's really exciting if we can get so many of them. It is slightly worrying that most MPs I know if they want to find out the text of a debate, use they work for you, because the hand stuff is so rubbish. <laughs> OK, let's see if we can get another quarter in. Let's start with James from the front. Thanks, Mark. Uh, James Oakes and I live in Tallinn in Estonia. And I'm here to tell you that you are 20 years behind already. <laughs> and that gap is going to accelerate. Because uh, I think there are some several fundamental questions. That, you know, archives, we've had that now 10 years. Um, issues in terms of governance, absolutely, that's been there all the time. The question, though, is how you structure things. Now, with Estonia, you have an e-government uh, X backbone, which um, you access, and anybody else who accesses your data, you own it. So you can see who's accessed your data. The only exception is the secret police, who, by definition, is secret. <laughs> um, uh, when and the have, NSA, presumably. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it might be quite hard for the NSA to hack in. Unless they've been given the key by, oh, wait a minute, our secret space. Um, but the conclusion, I think, is um, you have to start thinking in a different way about privacy. Uh, and at the moment, we still have this uh, idea that everything is, in theory, private, unless it's public. Where, in fact, the thing about uh, owning data in Estonia is everything is public, unless it's private, which primarily is medical records. Uh, so clearly, we're going to have to think about how we structure these things. But it is truly shocking. I'm actually genuinely shocked to hear some of the things you're saying tonight. 
Um, because, you know, this is, is it that bad? I had no idea. And the lady just behind you. Um, hi there, um, my name is Ram from Shelter, um, the Housing and Homelessness Charity. Um, we help around 3 million people a year with housing advice, and we use three main channels telephones, uh, online, and face to face. So we're very of the thinking that digital by default isn't really the right underlying principle, it's more digital as appropriate. And I just wondered um, what the kind of themes on that were. Okay, let's go over there. Uh, gentlemen at the back, the one one in. Very similar to the last question, Julian introduced it beautifully, but an awful lot of people are not yet using computers. The ONS is doing the surveys, a number of people using in the last three months or so. It's still a lot of people. We're not going to realise savings until you no longer need someone, you know, to come and hand a cash over and paper or fill in forms and so forth. And what is the right approach to that? Is it you just wait for fly off? Is it you have some sort of intermediary? Is it you train them up? However, you know, resistant they are. How do you address that digital divide question? That's a very good question. And then let's take a walk from this. Let's come on hands to sign up. Yeah, okay, gentlemen, next to you. Um, just to say, uh, Mary, Sorry, uh, Jake Evans of Coastal, um, Mary mentioned uh, she's in touch with both with Fargeball, but presumably we think at some point in the future it will happen. Just wondering whether, uh, how, how far off we think. Um, public confidence in the technology is to, to make that happen. Yeah. Okay, should we, um, should we start with you this time? And then let's, let's see how we get through those questions. So the sort of digital inclusion debate, I mean, is something we're very alive to because obviously we um, do offer connectivity, but I think there are different ways of looking at how you engage with people. And so we would certainly agree that you, and I think this sort of theme touched on by sort of actually lots of points raised this evening, um, it's about thinking again how you offer services, how you engage, how you, well, not just engage, how you talk with people. Um, we're a founding partner of Martha Lane Fox's organisation, Go On, which is very much about looking at digital skills. So you're always taking a step back. Do, do people have the confidence they've got the skills to engage? And, and that can be from you know, somebody like you know, my, late great, my late grandmother, who didn't think a computer was for her, but was very happy on a mobile phone, which obviously now all of us have mobiles that give connectivity to the internet and the services. So I think that piece around the sort of skills and inclusion debate is absolutely crucial, because then also that will unlock people who are new to the services with new ideas that could then sort of be the next app that is a big success. And I guess we're about to discover probably somewhat painfully, how some of that can work with universal credit, with the idea that if you're not online, you go to, effectively, you go to somebody who is online, and you sit with them and do the stuff, and all the issues that will throw up. So I suspect if we were to have this discussion in six months or a year's time, we'd have a lot more evidence of what works and what doesn't work. The interesting thing about the universal credit debate, obviously, a lot of that's been around when you access it online, mm. and when you hear that word online, it's a sort of a traditional model, big computer on a table, yes, that's very with lots of things connected to it. Whereas if you look at the mobile phone take-up mm. in the UK, it's at over 100% penetration. Now, a lot of that is obviously people, and members of parliament, people in business who have two <laughs> devices. Um, <laughs> or maybe you're about to only have one, but I'm sure you have more at home. <laughs> <laughs> so there's certainly some members yeah. of the community with two ways of connecting, but there will also be a lot of people in that market with being less credit who have a device that if they have the confidence and skills, which sort of the skills of it, they would be able to access. Chris, should we go for you next? Yeah. Um, so I guess at this point on digital by default, digital is appropriate. Um, I think in our report we said digital full stop. Um, <laughs> The thing for me is um, that you can't, you wouldn't want to digitize absolutely everything. Um, and as I said earlier, there are plenty of instances where face to face is really, really important. So, so as you say, it's a question of finding out um, where that's appropriate. But I think being brave about that. So, um, one of the things that you know, we've looked at over the course of the research is um, that lots of things in the, um, when you walk into job center plus as a job seeker, there's lots of aspects of that process that could be digitized. You could save a lot of time, you could help you, frankly, get on with looking for a job rather than waiting to read the paperwork. Um, but when you talk to the advisors, they would say, you wouldn't want to move all of that online because actually we need to see someone face to face and look them in the eye and assess their circumstances and understand their feelings. Um, so it's, I guess, holding on to that and then um, 
frankly, binning the stuff which is just woefully inefficient. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I was um, talking to someone a little while ago about um, the process that they went through um, moving uh, pensions from just paper-based to paper-based and telephone. Obviously, a while back, and you know, all the debate then was, well, people will never use the phone for um, you know interacting with um, DWP or whatever it was then. Um, and of course, now we're in this world of saying, well, shut down the phone lines and move it online. And you know, one suspects that um, the pace of change is rapid, and before you know it, um, the world will look maybe more look like the same. Interesting. Doesn't I don't know if that means there's a scope for a bit to make political comeback. But anyway, there we go. I think I need to do with the Evo issue. Yes. Um, but also to say that all my work I've done, I've always emphasised a multi channel approach to communications. And that deciding the balance that you have within that is, is up for, depends on the um, particular. Um, uh, Transactions that you're involved in. Yeah, e-voting. Um, yeah, you'd think I'd be terribly enthusiastic about it, wouldn't you? Uh, after all, I, I wouldn't dream of booking a hotel, um, booking a holiday or anything unless I could do it online. You know, I'd do all that stuff. Of course I do. I'm confident about that. And in fact, the public is very confident. The, the public is not the problem with e-voting. Um, you know, they use the national lottery and they don't think, you know, where's this stuff going? Um, is the system fair? Is it actually uh, rigged in any way? It doesn't occur to them, they just trust it, don't they? Getting the public to trust it's not the problem. They vote for X Factor and they don't think, well, maybe it's rigged. Um, <laughs> people, <laughs> they think it's rigged, but they still vote <laughs> The people you have to, to convince are the candidates and their agents. It's us you have to convince. When I go to the count, and I'm sitting there doing my box counts and uh, you know, watching the piles and challenging the numbers and asking for uh, you know, another um, count bundle count or whatever it is we want, it's physically in front of me and I can be convinced that that is pretty much the right number. Yeah. Um, it would take a very complex system to convince me that the e-voting system has not been tampered with in some way. There's a long chain, after all, right from the software developers through into the um, organisations who, who are actually handling it and local governments. Um, I, the, I've seen one or two suggestions about the ways in which this could be done, but it would involve the political parties themselves having access to open source software that's being used for the system and being able to um, examine it. Then the answer is, what happens about independent candidates? Would they be disadvantaged? Because they would, unless they happen to have expertise, they wouldn't be able to draw on that in order to examine it. There may be solutions, but I've yet to be convinced that there's one. Now, I'm not asking for perfection. I'm asking for a system which I feel at least as confident about the result as I do with traditional paper votes, because, which I know is not 100%, you know, there's elements there, but I need to be at least as confident about that. And I, I guess the key difference from something like online banking is that with something like banking, you know roughly what your bank balance should be. Mm. And so if you something check. seems to be really yeah. odd, you've got evidence you can go back to check. The whole, the whole thing with election results is we don't know what the result There's should no, be, which is a no tough track. standard. But Julian, okay. do you want to uh, pick up on um, those bits and maybe also particularly the Estonian point? Well, 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 politically, you made reference to it. Well, well I have to say, my, my response to the Estonian point is I should probably go and have a look and find out what's happening there because yes. uh, I'd be very interested if we could talk about yeah. a way of saying that because if there is a great model, which I don't know anything about, I should try and know about it. I look forward to that. Um, just to touch on e-voting, I, I share a lot of various concerns. Uh, there are, I suspect, ways around. I think open source can help. I think having something which is electronic and also has a hard copy so that it is in theory possible to verify might be a way forward. We have seen a lot of instances where um, there have been cases where e-voting is rather questionable. Um, I would note that in Parliament we don't even get as close to anything else as we stand in corridors waiting to vote. So, you know, we could modernise a little bit more than that. On the digital divide thing, I think this is really key. You have to engage across the different ways. 
And there are ways, you know, you know one can do things online, not just by being being in, uh, telling people to get a computer, but by having a tablet thing which you could take to them. And that, you know, that's in many ways better than getting them to write it on pen. Or you could type, as they say, something. We can save a lot of multiple data entry. Um, so there are a number of ways of doing it, but you do need to be aware of it. There's also, of course, people who are, for example, blind. And this is forgotten, and you know, all sorts of other issues are forgotten far too often. What looks like a beautiful website, when you then get somebody blind to use it, yeah. It can be really, really hard. I have it. My mother is richly blind, so I know how she struggles with some of these websites where, you know, it's fantastic for me to use. She cannot. Um, and the last thing I just want to say on that is there's a field called uh, inclusive design, which is a handful of people works on. Um, and that has been trying to make design things, typically physical objects, also online things, for particular purposes. What they found is that it's often helpful for everybody else. So, uh, do you remember the days when all kettles had a sort of awkward cord thing that you had to try to fit in? Um, what happened was people said this wasn't usable by old people with arthritis. And so to solve the arthritis problem, it was a very specialist thing, they came up with the idea of having a base and a kettle you could just rest on it. You know, that was done specifically for people with arthritis. Turns out everybody likes it because it was a pain to have to put the thing in and whatnot. We can, you know, we could, I can do it, but it's annoying. They're almost impossible to get the old style. So actually, if you think about inclusive design and make it possible for as many people as possible to use a service, actually we'll probably all find it nice and clean and simple and not quite as messy, but we can sort of manage. So I look forward to Trevor. Fantastic. Uh, despite all your admiral brevity, we've overrun slightly, so I'm afraid we're going to have to call it, call it a day there. Apologies for the speakers didn't manage to get to, but uh, certainly Julian and Mary, and I think our other panelists as well, are around for more of conference, so I'm sure they'll be only <laughs> too happy for you to grab them, especially if you're free to buy them a drink, I guess, at the time, but only too happy to, to grab them. And the report that it made reference to, that's available on the Policy Exchange website, is it not? Yeah, so if you go to Google or other search engines, or indeed there are some hard copies at the back, so it just remains for me to thank, uh, thank the panelists, and if you would uh, give them the customary Sorry? Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Other search engines are, are available. <laughs> <laughs>